My guest wears many hats. He's a historian, one of Asia's leading economists, a best-selling author, and an environmentalist. He is Sanjeev Sanyal, member of Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. Today on Pathbreakers, we'll discuss a wide range of topics to understand what it takes to be a dynamic storyteller of other narratives. Stay tuned to Pathbreakers. I am Neha Bothra. much for joining us. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We plan to talk to you on a whole range of issues. You wear so many hats after all. So how do you like to describe yourself? Well, I, I, it's difficult to say how one describes myself. Uh, it's up to you to how to describe me. I, I, I am a proud Indian, a proud Hindu, a proud Bengali. Uh, I work as an economist, but I also I like writing books. Uh, I like, you know, I live my life the way I I see it fit and uh, I enjoy it. You are one of Asia's leading economists, a historian, a best-selling author, an environmentalist, an urban theorist. Where do we begin? Well, I have done a lot of things in life, but let me say that there is an underlying uh, intellectual framework to much of what I say, whether in these various fields. And I described it many in my writings. It's called uh, complexity theory. So basically the fundamental idea behind complexity theory is that the world is, uh, as it evolves, is basically buffeted by all kinds of factors. So they can be the actions of individuals, it can be grand social or economic forces, technology, geopolitics and so on. So the entire idea is that you cannot see the world in silos. And therefore, it shouldn't be too surprising that I happen to see the world in this rather fluid way because that is the starting point of my entire intellectual framework. So let's go back to your childhood. Tell me a bit about that. You come from a very illustrious family that was closely involved with the freedom struggle. Did that in any way shape your ideologies? So it may be have done so subliminally. Uh, growing up, of course, I knew many of these characters, as you mentioned, both from my mother's and my father's side. There were very, uh, a lot of members of my family were involved in the freedom struggle, particularly in the uh, revolutionary uh, strain of the freedom struggle, the armed struggle. And it's quite possible that I was influenced by many of their ideas. Uh, but I would also say that uh, it was not conscious. I was also uh, influenced a lot by the fact that I grew up in uh, communist ruled Kolkata. Um, and uh, witnessed firsthand the decline of the city under um, communist rule. So in, in many ways that has also a very strong influence in the way I view the world. Uh, when I was at university uh, in Delhi, uh, I witnessed uh, uh, the breakdown of our economy and the reforms of 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, and so on. So uh, if you look at the way I see the world, you'll see there is always a strain of uh, a suspicion about socialism and, and, and the state. Uh, so maybe those are the influences that are there. But yes, my own family background also has an influence, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. That is amply clear because many of your books clearly have a strong focus on the other narrative. The missing gaps, you know, forgotten stories about heroes, uh, missing episodes in history. Our history books don't mention it. Let's talk a bit about that. How did you go about gathering evidence? How did you do your fact checks? And what really led you to uncover these stories and tell it the way you did? So one of the things that I always felt uh, reading my school textbooks, like many of you have suffered through the same ones, uh, is how it doesn't quite all make sense. Um, first of all, it didn't seem to have anything to do with me. Um, you know, I was growing up in Kolkata, a family that had quite a role to play in India's freedom struggle. But the whole story that we learned in our textbook seemed to have nothing to do with me. It seemed to be about Mughals in Delhi, mostly about invaders uh, who had ruled over India. And I always wondered where on earth uh, was my story. And this must be true of many other Indians. There are parts of the country that are not even mentioned, uh, like the Northeast or Goa. So I think there is a disjunction a lot of Indians feel uh, about history. It's an angst that I myself felt. And at one point in time, I began to do my own research and then I discovered, hey, there is a lot of other histories, a lot of information. Actually, 
The sad part is much of this history is just lying around for you to search up. Uh, even, you know, amateur scratching will allow you to find a lot of this uh, information everywhere. You mentioned this in one of your books as well about how India's history is very different when viewed from the coastlines. How do we apply this in the modern context when you have neighbours like Pakistan and China and India is trying to look beyond immediate neighbours to strengthen economic and diplomatic ties? What are your views on this? We are the only country which has actually has an ocean named after us. Yes. <laughs> uh, we have a very long coastline and a very long and illustrious uh, maritime history both of exploration and trade and spreading of ideas and so on. Sadly, after independence, we have tended to have a very continental, landlocked view of the world. And when we think of our neighbours, we'll always think of our friendly neighbour to the west uh, and also uh, perhaps an equally friendly neighbour to uh, our northeast. Uh, and that is, tends to be the neighbours we tend to think of. But if you take a maritime view of things, then we have totally different neighbours. Um, of course, there are the near and near ones like Sri Lanka and so on, but you can also think of Indonesia as a neighbor or Singapore or um, Oman and the UAE or some countries on the east coast of, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, of Africa. Uh, even Australia is a neighbor. I mean, unfortunately, people have a mental image of Australia as a Pacific country. Yes. But in fact, it's also an Indian Ocean country. I think this is important. Uh, multiple levels. First of all, we have very long cultural links to uh, many of these countries. I mean, Indonesia is called Indonesia, named after us. Mm -hmm. Its national symbol is uh, the Garuda, Vishnu's Garuda. Uh, its uh, currency is called the Rupiah. Uh, there's a country called Singapura, Singapore. You know, the currency used in much of the Middle East was the Indian rupee till the 1960s. We should stop thinking of the world in this landlocked way. Because unfortunately, then it locks our own uh, worldview. Uh, unnecessarily, whereas a maritime view is fluid, uh, it allows us to build uh, interesting linkages with all these countries I just mentioned and others as well. Uh, and I think that is something we are beginning to do finally in the last few years mm -hmm. and uh, it has borne results. How do we view this So, at a time when China, for example, is um, increasing its um, aggression when it comes to hostilities with neighbouring countries uh, over its penchant for redrawing borders. We need to take into account the fact that China is an emerging, has emerged as a, as a very powerful uh, force in the world uh, as an economy, but increasingly assertive even in militarily in many ways. But I think the problem that has happened is that in very recent times, last I would say five, six years, uh, the Chinese have been much more belligerent on various fronts. Uh, they've been belligerent with us with, on our own border, but also threatening other neighbours, for example, Taiwan, for example. So this is something that we do need to take into account in our calculations. This is not to suggest that we want to go to war with them or that we will not trade with them. I mean, they are a part of the global supply chain. Uh, we will participate with them. We will trade with them. We will compete with them and also collaborate with them where our own interests uh, uh, coincide. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean we will be blind to the fact that um, a, a China, particularly an undemocratic uh, China, uh, can be uh, a geostrategic challenge. And for that we will make uh, arrangements and protect our interests. Mm -hmm. Where necessary, we will consequently build uh, alliances of various kinds, of course their quad is the more ob most obvious one. Mm -hmm. How do you see the world order changing, you know, given the economic stress in China and also the fact that it has an aging population, not just China, in fact you were one of the first few to speak about this I think 15 years back when you said that the world will be facing a declining population. Of course it was met with a lot of criticism at an international level, but how do you see this play for India now? So of course, demographics is a very important driver of many things, much underappreciated. And over a decade ago, I began to make the point that look, the world's population, unlike what the UN and others keep drumming up, is going to turn a lot earlier than anybody expects. Uh, my argument was somewhere in the uh, late 2050s, early 2060s, the world population will stop growing and 
but before the end of the, the century, it will be shrinking quite quickly. Now, of course, that is for the world population. For individual countries, this is already happening, as is ha already happening by China, and we shouldn't be surprised by that. This is also going to be the case with India as well. Sure, we are now going to the next quarter of a century, it's going to be sort of a, you can call it the demographic dividend period or the golden age or whatever, where our dependency ratio will be declining, a very large proportion of our population will be in the working age, and of course, we should hopefully be able to use that. But do remember that we are also are aging, and that from around maybe the middle of the century, we too will tip over into a world where we will begin to age, and at some point, even our population will begin to shrink somewhat later. So, the reason I'm making this point is we this will have a big influence on the way the world's dynamics works. And we need to prepare for these uh, changes, which si simply does not seem to occur into the calculations of uh, policymakers anywhere in the world mm -hmm. uh, in the way it should. So essentially, you know, when you're talking about China having a declining population and India will walk that path, but in the interim 15 years or so, when we do have the demographic dividend to enjoy, what really can we do so as to make sure that we reap the dividends and not take it as a liability looking at the job numbers and the reforms that we have been talking about in the education sector for a very long time, but they haven't really gone through. So let me make one thing very clear, that our economy needs growth. This whole debate about jobless growth is a red herring. We should not get distracted by this. We need to generate growth and generate growth in multiple sectors. Once one sector cannot do it, we have a large population and a diverse economy. We are capable of doing this. So never allow anyone to divert you into this conversation about jobless growth. It's a complete dead end conversation. We need growth. Now, Obviously, we have to make sure that, that, that there is a population that can take advantage of this growth. And yes, skilling is a very important part. If you look at all the conversations we are having about skilling, it's a major uh, segment of our budget as well as uh, our policy making. But also very important that we find other ways of skilling. Just formal skilling, in, i.e. everybody goes to university, is not a meaningful way of doing it. But also a very important part of this is that maintain flexibility in our labor markets. Do remember that many of the jobs that the next generation will do, do not exist today. So we need to think about this much more fluidly. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, in fact, India is being seen as the shining star in the global economy at a time when we are talking about Western economies slipping into a recession, there's financial tightening. All these factors are there as well, but there is a general confidence that India is relatively insulated. But uh, what do you think are the speed breakers when it comes to India's growth story? So in terms of our internal dynamics, there is a pretty good um, uh, momentum. Um, as you know, we are going to spend a lot of money on infrastructure, which is absolutely critical. And uh, our ability to deliver has also dramatically gone up in recent years. Mm -hmm. However, do note that the world economy is an uncertain place. So this puts, for the time being, some limitations on our ability to grow. So we are right now growing at somewhere in the six and a half percent range. Now our economy is actually capable of growing it faster, maybe eight, nine percent. But for now, we can't press the accelerator because if we do, then domestic demand will grow too fast. We will suck in imports, but our exports will simply not be able to grow at the same speed because the rest of the world is in recession and we will end up with a current account problem. So given that context, I think quite correctly, our macroeconomic managers are keeping things tight. I am not in favor of trying to push growth too hard at this point. Um, six and a half, maybe seven percent, that's somewhere in that range is a good enough growth for uh, the game is to keep compounding it and importantly at some point the world economy too will turn and will begin to grow. Mm -hmm. At that point in time we should be ready to be able to take advantage of that and that is why all this infrastructure that we are building is important. When the time comes, we should be able to export stuff out. Mm -hmm. You know, also many economists are a bit cautious about the growth projections for FY24. Much of the budget math has been done assuming that the nominal GDP growth would be 10.5%. Some economists are skeptical. They feel it could be as low as 9% around that level. How do you think this will be 
impacting the targets when it comes to fiscal deficit, 5.9% for FY24 and 4.5% for FY26. Do these numbers look realistic? Uh, these are very conservative numbers. Uh, okay. If you look at the budget projections for nominal GDP growth, they are very, very uh, 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 conservative. Okay. They're in fact more conservative than the ones in the economic survey or in fact even than the, what the IMF, World Bank and others are using. So, I am quite confident that these numbers will be hit. I, uh, if anything, they are conservative. Mm -hmm. So, we are talking about rapid growth here. Yes, and yes, we, we, we are growing very rapidly and we are easily the fastest growing economy in the world by some margin. The question is, can we grow faster? And the answer is yes. But we require a clear highway ahead of us in terms of the world economy. Because I do not think we should be attempting to accelerate growth too fast when the rest of the world is not conducive to an export push. Mm -hmm. How do you think we are trying to fit in climate goals uh, as we pursue high growth? You are an expert in this area and you've done in-depth study when it comes to environment and you have a very interesting take on how we should approach sustainability as a concept. Tell us about that. So, of course, the energy transition is a good thing for uh, climate change and restricting carbon emissions. Uh, but it's also good we are not a hydrocarbon rich country. Uh, we are not a country endowed with a large amount of uh, uh, oil and gas. We have some coal, but not a great deal of it. Uh, but we have lots of sunshine. So, it fits in with our agenda that we should be able to do this transition. But I would like to, in this context, also point out that um, too much of the conversation ends up being only about uh, carbon and mitigation. Mm -hmm. We have to pay attention to adaptation. Uh, whatever happens, uh, the climate will change, whether because of human uh, intervention or because naturally climate changes. There are other areas of uh, environmental management that we seem not to pay attention to. For example, managing the oceans uh, or managing the use of plastics, which we are just scattering into the environment. Mm -hmm. What's environmental accounting as co-founder of GIST? Um, this is an area that you have pioneered. Tell us a bit about this. This was something I did with a colleague of mine. More than 20 years ago decided that, look, if you want to manage something, you need to begin to put some monetary values on various things. You need this for a variety of reasons, for compensation, for court cases, but also just, just to manage it. Because once you put numbers down, then you, it, it begins to uh, become much easier to uh, uh, make trade-offs or uh, and, and even explain if there's a rapid depletion somewhere. So many years ago, decided that we got to recalculate uh, India's GDP based on an environmental basis. Okay. And so as, as part of that exercise, we, we did a lot of experiments in methodologies, uh, many of which we published. Those then went on to become global standards. These methodologies of green accounting have now become quite widely used across the world uh, for corporate accounting, for uh, accounting of various kinds. It has some use. Uh, I will not overplay it, but it, it, it is an important part of how to get, um, you know, environmental issues into national accounts in a way or corporate accounts in a way where a uh, you know, trade-offs can be made and various conversations can be held using some hard numbers. Mm -hmm. So, how does India's GDP stand when you look at it from the environmental accounting lens? So, we haven't done a green accounting exercise for very recent times, okay. but uh, it is the case that you will find that there are some areas where we do rather well and not so, uh, there are areas where we don't so, do so well. Uh, at least going back to looking at data now for quite some time back, um, managing our water resources, for example, would, uh, you know, uh, the depletion of groundwater or pollution in our rivers and so on uh, would, would have come up with being a fairly significant uh, negative uh, contribution in our national accounts if we collect, correctly calculated them. But as I said, I have personally not uh, revisited uh, this in very recent times, so let me not uh, give you sort of outdated numbers. How should we plan our cities? You know, when we talk about growth, there's a lot of migration into urban cities. What's an ideal way to manage cities so that they are sustainable and uh, better places to live in? There are many things. This is a very vast subject. Uh, one big problem that we have in India mm -hmm. is that we have a mental block against villages. Somehow, the process of urbanization is seen as being somehow suspect in its own right and therefore to be discouraged. 
Um, this is quite odd. Um, also important is that whether we like it or not, the process of development leads to urbanization. Now, I'm not making the case that everybody has got to move to Delhi Moom NCR. Urbanization comes in many forms. Uh, urbanizing our villages in many ways is also part of the urbanization process. So first thing we need to do is to embrace urbanization and say that it's not something to be suspicious of or discourage. Having said that, we also need to move away from this rigid master plan view of cities. To the extent that we do plan our cities, we tend to do this in this very rigid, formulaic sort of way. You know, our entire idea of urban planning is we need to zone everything. And this has caused great amount of damage to the way we run our cities. Our building codes, for example, are utterly outdated. And it's very important that we stop having these standardized building codes, allow for architectural innovation, which is relevant to that place from its climate, for its geology, and of course, for its culture. So allowing for more fluidity in our building codes is absolutely critical. Over the past one decade or so, I think you've written five editions of the Economic Survey, plus nine books, plus 200 published articles. How did you find time to do everything, given your responsibilities as a member of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council as well? Well, I enjoy doing many of these things. Uh, so, in, 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 uh, uh, I, I, I'm surprised other people don't have time to do it. <laughs> I am deeply involved in uh, the economic uh, uh, management uh, of the economy. Uh, but as I said, since I do not see the world in silos, I do not think many of these things are separate from each other. Um, to understand the economy uh, and how it evolves, you need to understand how it interacts with everything, including with its past. Sure. Uh, you need to understand geostrategic issues. I am very interested in technology. What's in the works now? Tell us a bit about projects and ideas that you're exploring, working on, that we should look forward to. Oh, there are large numbers of projects. Uh, I, could, uh, I could give you a very long list. Uh, of course, there are many projects I'm doing in terms of exploring, uh, for example, uh, particularly uh, uh, going through the data for government uh, cases that the government uh, has to fight. There is a whole gamut of areas that I'm working on, for example, uh, looking at data collection, data related issues of the economy that I'm going to be writing on. Then um, there is one thing that I'm doing, which is uh, not related to economics, uh, which is related to um, uh, history again. Um, I've been working on a project to build a ancient ship using stitched, uh, stitched uh, shipbuilding techniques. So build a, a, a wooden ship using a 2000 year old technology and design and see if I can sail that from uh, Odisha to uh, Bali. Wow. Yeah, that would be a fun thing to do. And uh, so that is a project that is uh, in process. We have designed the ship and the, the culture ministry and the Navy will collaborate to build this uh, ship. So it will take a few years to build it, but then uh, that's another project, completely different space. Clearly, and there's a lot to talk about as well, but I think we'll need to end the conversation here. Thank you so much for your time, Sanjeev Sanyal. It was a pleasure speaking with you and learning about so many new things. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a pleasure.